bet the board. What do you mean you don't bet? I mean, I don't bet. You know, I don't care. I don't. Wizard. I never have, and I never will. Yeah, right. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. You owe me 15 grand, pal. Pay him. Pay that man his money. It's the Bet the Board podcast. God likes me. He really, really likes me. In the end, I wound up right back where I started. I could still pick winners, and I could still make money for all kinds of people back home. And why mess up a good thing? Here's Payne Insider and Todd Furman. Welcome into the Bet the Board podcast, NFL Week 7, Monday Night Football Edition. Busy show on tap with a pair of Monday Night Football games, a little prop breakdown to get you to the window, and of course a recap for everything that's already unfolded so far in the National Football League. I'm your host, Todd Furman, joined as always by my esteemed colleague and co-host on this fine program, the one, the only, Payne Insider. And Payne, it's another Monday in the middle of the NFL season, I mean, energy levels for you, Oof. plus or minus uh, 20% in terms of the overall battery. They were great at like 6.30 this morning. I was feeling vibrant, and now we've kind of crashed, and it's not even 11 a.m. yet. So, <laughs> Always an uplifting start to the program. <laughs> you gotta, we got to get through this thing. Uh, we'll grind through it, uh, as we always do. And on Monday mornings, the tradition is to kick things off with the good, the bad, and the ugly. And because we are both the model of positivity every single Monday morning through the fall, I'm going to give you honors out of the tee box to highlight what you think was the most positive thing that you saw transpire on a football field since Thursday. One of the big games that we broke down last week, it came down to a matchup that we said would determine that side of the ball, and it was Jared Goff and the Lions offense holding their own against Brian Flores' vaunted blitz. I watched that thing and I said, man, this was just a, a group effort. Detroit's offensive line, really good, so it can handle the extra pass rushers better than just about anybody. Plus, they're a little more familiar uh, with, with, with Brian Flores. Ben Johnson has built in more help into some of those offensive concepts to fight pressure, knowing traditionally how it's impacted golf. And then the talent, you start to look at, St. Brown and JMO and Laporte and Gibbs, if you're going to single these these gentlemen because you send pressure and the Lions O line keeps golf clean, that that foursome's probably going to routinely win one on one and do it pretty quickly. So I was impressed by that effort and everyone helps in protection. I went back and I was like, boy, that was really interesting how they chose to block that up. That St. Brown touchdown. Go back and look at that. It was like this slide right protection where both Montgomery and Tim Patrick are double teaming and completely wiping out Van Ginkle. But if you look, all told, Brian Flores blitzed Goff on 55% of dropbacks yesterday. Goff went 13 for 15 for 163 yards and a touchdown completion rate, 11% over expectation when blitzed. So Goff, Ben Johnson, and and the Lions players figured out how – how to win that equation against Brian Flores. 10 total incompletions for Jared Goff in his last 68 passing attempts spanning three games. And while we've talked at great lengths about how sensitive Jared Goff is to pressure, I mean, he's been one of the best quarterbacks performing against it so far this season. And that felt like his Mona Lisa against the Minnesota Vikings in a key divisional game, knocking the Vikings from the ranks of the unbeaten, despite Minnesota having two weeks to prepare and getting the explosive to start the game, playing with a 7 nothing lead. So kudos to the Detroit Lions, starting to resemble the team we thought they could be coming into the year, part of the reason we had exposure on over their win total, thinking they were a legitimate threat, if not the team to beat, in the NFC. AFC counterparts... We mentioned the Buffalo Bills going out there and acquiring Amari Cooper going into the Thursday show. It wasn't a game that we did a deep dive on with them right around a double-digit favorite against the Tennessee Titans. Josh Allen started to look like Josh Allen a little bit more, dropped back to pass on 33 of the 54 offensive snaps for the Bills, led the league in passing with 323 yards, finished with a completion percentage, 7.3% above expectation, fourth-highest passer rating, and most importantly, Payne, 
Allen did a tremendous job to get everybody to chip in. Khalil Shakir, seven catches. Amari Cooper, four catches. Your boy, Keon Coleman, the light bulb apparently has gone on, or trading for a veteran receiver, lit a fire under his ass, four for a buck 25, and Dalton Kincaid as well. The Bills offense that we had concerns about has at least answered them for one week, albeit against the Titans secondary that was playing without Legereus Sneed. You know, <laughs> this one's interesting to me because, and our, our listeners will be like, yeah, we hear this every week. The Titans became a little appealing at 10, and there were some, some buys there from some pretty sharp folks. And for about two plus quarters, that thing looked gold. And and you and I watch games a little bit differently. The Bills' offense has been a point of contention for me for multiple seasons. I just think there's more to be had. I don't think it's a horrific offense. I just they're not reaching the peak. I'll and agree, I love I'll agree Amari there. Cooper. Hundred percent, I'll agree with yeah. you there. And and there's nobody that likes Amari Cooper more than me, other than some of his family members. And mechanically, that trade was was fantastic. Getting getting Cooper in a sixth for a third and a fifth, and because Cleveland needed cap room, they converted Cooper's twenty million into a signing bonus earlier this season. So the Bills are paying like Amari 800 k for the rest of the season. These are the types of of low-risk signings that that put contenders over the top, and I'm shocked there weren't uh, there wasn't a bidding war uh, for Cooper's services. I understand he's he's looked tragically bad, uh, but you know we, we've outlined that Cleveland situation numerous times now. However, yesterday... Which did hit rock bottom yesterday. <laughs> yes, it did. A- a- at least early in the Buffalo game, it was a struggle for the offense again. They had six first-half drives. Four of them were three and out. One was a five-play, two-yard drive. The other was a three-play TD aided by the Keon Coleman explosive. It was a 30% first-half success rate, which was 23rd out of 26 offenses, only seven offensive points. So I, I didn't get that vibe from the Bills' offense initially. Now, second half, different story, and I thought it was almost the McDermott adjustments defensively that sparked this because... They got the massive fourth down stop which, when the game was 10-7. Which I'm seven. still trying to figure out. I'm all about being aggressive, but your defense had played well. If you're Coach Callahan, that felt to me, uh, I don't want to say desperate, but real boomer bust. I, yeah, but I mean, you, you know, you're looking for a spark this season. You got kind of fucked on the spot, you know, a couple of plays early. Probably shouldn't have been a first down, so it was a big swing. But regardless, Buffalo gets the fourth down stop, and, and the offense starts possession on the Titans 41 the entire second half. The Bills' starting field position was fantastic because the Titans' offense was anemic, and again, some of those McDermott adjustments at halftime for his defense. The first four Bills' drives of the second half had an average starting field position of the 45-yard line. Now, Joe Brady made some adjustments of his own, but to your point, the Titans' defense was was ravaged by injuries. The top two cover corners were out. Sneed was out, and Abouzier's on IR. Cedric Gray, the Titans' green dot, was a late scratch despite practicing in full all week. I'm I'm trying to be cautiously optimistic because there hasn't been a, you know, again, a bigger Amari Cooper truther aside from some family members there over the years. Let's see what this looks like against the potentially healthier Mike McDonald defense this week in Seattle. But they did they did spread the ball around, which is kind of what their offense has been all season. It just has better parts now with Amari Cooper because everyone else kind of takes a, a notch down. But what's really funny is late in this game, Josh is looking around. He's like, okay, Keon got involved. And Amari Cooper's here, and he's getting a ton of targets. Like, I got to get my boy Shakir going. And I think they targeted him every single play on one of those drives <laughs> when the game was already settled. And he blew through some of his his prop numbers, which I, I know a lot of sharp guys were on because they got depressed based upon the addition of Amari Cooper. Uh, so there was there were some sharp guys that were quite happy with that one singular drive. Other uh, positive performances that stood out to you so far for the week? There were a couple. Would do you want to do you want to go to Sunday Night Football? Usually we recap yeah, that, but then use, there was also some nice revenge for, use for Saquon. Sunday, yeah, I mean, I was going to use Sunday Night Football to kind of pivot from the good to the bad, but so we can okay. Hit, so let's go Saquon. Saquon. So go ahead. Okay, I I think this was was a little twofold. I think we're looking at the Jalen Hurts offense and not the Kellen Moore offense we all expected. So long term, it feels like the ceiling is capped a little bit on. On Philadelphia, the Giants certainly weren't threatening on offense, so it became a 45-15 to run-to-pass game for Philly. Gainwell helped out, thought he was efficient, and, and some 
some of a backup role there, but Saquon was the most efficient back of the week so far against his old team. 17 carries for 176 and a touchdown. On those 17 runs, Barkley averaged nearly five and a half yards per rush attempt over expectations. So those 17 runs should have yielded about 83 yards instead of the 176. So Barkley got his revenge. And I just kind of go back to hard knocks in the preseason where where Mara was saying he didn't want to have nightmares thinking about <laughs> Saquon Barkley playing for a division rival. So uh, no nightmares. He was able to to witness it uh, in real time while he was wide awake. Uh, so so good for Saquon there. Yeah, pretty impressive performance in a homecoming of sorts. You do wonder if the Eagles get themselves into a negative game state, what that passing attack will look like, but something that they haven't faced in back-to-back weeks and wins against the Cleveland Browns. And then, of course, knocking off the Giants to the tune of 28-3. to You mentioned the Sunday night football game and the Steelers' balanced attack. They dig themselves a 15-6 to hole early in that game and then come storming back in something we haven't seen from the Steelers maybe since the 70s where they rattle off 30 unanswered points. And the offense appeared to show a little bit more balance. Russell Wilson throwing the moon ball, getting George Pickens involved in the act, opened some things up in the ground game behind a lot of depth pieces on the offensive line. Now, when you open up the hood and you look at Russell Wilson's numbers, completion percentage over expectation, and a lot of the underlying metrics, not overly great by any stretch of the imagination. I found it interesting that he described his performance to being a baseball player, that he started 0 for 2 at the plate and then started to catch fire. I think that might be a little bit of an aggressive overstatement. But Najee Harris showed elusiveness, and you know, as far as running backs are concerned, over the last couple of weeks, rushing yards over expectation, you know, top three in the league, and you know, made seven defenders miss, something that I think was possible. Now, then again, the Jets' run defense invents ways to make every running back look great, but the Steelers do deserve credit for their overall performance there, erasing that deficit and winning with margin against Aaron Rodgers and company. We're going to be playing hurt the rest of this podcast. Just bump my elbow on the desk there. Bumping the elbow on the um, desk is a little better than a paper cut. You just <laughs> have to remember when you go to Mayor Dinkins' doctor that you know if it's the right elbow or the left elbow. <laughs> little back and forth last night on that game, huh? That was an interesting one to see. A lot of the numbers guys were backing the Jets. The other, the other group uh, certainly had a... A differing mindset there, but terrible spot for the Jets, right? Trip to London in week four. Traditionally, teams want that buy after that. Instead, the Jets played two games in six days. And so I'm reluctant to say Jeff Albrich defensively has been a downgrade from Robert Salah, or if this was a fatigue spot with some injuries. It's probably both. But the Jets, to your point, could not stop the run again. Steelers finished fourth in EPA per rush on the week. And when Arthur Smith called on Russ to throw, it was a high variance approach, NBA style offense, right? It's a it's a layup or a three. And we saw multiple Russ moon balls, which we, we like, and we saw George Pickens of of being a, a pig and shit, aka going up for some contested catches. That's what he likes Actually to do. Out there running and, routes compared to the Sunday night football game against well, the Cowboys. Well, you know. Hey. hey running sprints 60 times a game and never seeing the ball can certainly get maddening. He so wasn't running I, sprints uh, in the first quarter of that game against the Cowboys, yeah. so I'm not giving him that kind of benefit of the doubt. Uh, the passing success rate for Pittsburgh, to your point, was was only 38%. It was good for 19th on the week, but Russ did have the second highest completed air yards of any quarterback this week. So let's see if that, that transitions uh, in prime time against the Giants, who do like to keep everything in front. Uh, probably a little bit of a different different vibe this week. But, uh, yeah, thought, thought you have to be super impressed or you have to at least have a viewpoint of Russ in the Steelers' offense exceeding any possible ex- expectation even fans have. Here's the brutal reality, and uh, it's not going to sit well with a lot of people out there because the Steelers were one of the biggest sells in their win total market coming into the year. I know you and I had a very different mindset. You look at what the Steelers have accomplished, five wins through their first seven games, and that back portion of the schedule, still difficult, but those two games against Cleveland don't look nearly as daunting, and we'll see if the Steelers have been able to figure out some of their offensive shortcomings. But defensively, if this group stays healthy, it's still definitely a plus unit. 
And when you're getting two interceptions like that from Beanie Wells, it goes a long way to taking some of the pressure off the offense. So that gives us the segue from the good to the bad. And I don't know if I'm being unfair, Payne, but somewhere along the way, this Jets defense that has all these accolades, all this supposed star power, has to raise its level of play. They did become a mash unit, lost both safeties in the game against the Steelers, started the game without DJ Reed, but the run defense remains a real problem. You sign Hassan Reddick, I guess he put pen to paper officially, so he'll be back in camp with the team. But when do you begin to go, okay, this Jets defense leaves a lot to be desired, and we can't be looking at them as a truly elite unit when you keep stacking up poor performances, especially against the run? It's a soft defense. I mean, they came in last night 25th in schedule adjusted rush efficiency, and they also graded out 22nd in tackling. So you have been able to run right at them. Sauce Gardner to this point has had a fine year for a normal quarter cornerback, but well below the standard he set in year one and year two. And there's not a ton of talent. I mean, I would say not as much talent as you think, especially along the defensive line. Now, well, Drew Rosenhaus preyed on a desperate owner attempting to play GM, and Hassan Reddick is back, to your point. I don't think there's ever been a more all-in 2-5 and five NFL team that I can recall. And you start to think about the Jets, and I don't think they're a bad team, right? They're clearly laying 2.5 and, and garnering some sharp money there on Sunday Night Football on the road to Pittsburgh. But this 2-5 and five team... The two wins have come against the Patriots and the Titans. And the Patriots is on a short week, and it required a comeback effort against the Titans. Two bottom seven power-rated teams. And so I think there's maybe a little misconception of what the Jets are uh, relative to reality. The saving grace here, though, Todd, and I don't mean to be all doom and gloom for Jets fans, the Jets have one of the five easiest remaining schedules in the NFL. Nobody has completely run away with the AFC. They're just two games back of the playoffs. So that's kind of how this is this is shaking out for the Jets in my mind. Maybe maybe they make a little bit of a run here. But something we talked about last week, it's like, I, I love Devontae Adams. Still, still probably has some juice left. How about this? You probably could have went out and got two defensive tackles for the same yeah, price. Yeah, I probably would right? have gone out and addressed yeah. a major position of need, especially... <laughs> when other GMs in the league smell blood in the water, and it's never a great sign when they're calling to inquire about the availability of Garrett Wilson. If anything, your receiver of the future now, who becomes potentially a second option, you wonder how that situation will continue to age. But the Jets do have a get-right game. They'll be right around a touchdown favorite on the road against New England, and then a couple of interesting games against the Texans at the Cardinals and Colts if they're going to get this thing turned around, get back to 500, and have a chance to fight for one of the other AFC wildcard bursts. Other bad that stood out to your well-seasoned eye so far this week during week seven? Um, 49ers, you want to go there? I- I'm happy to go uh, rip the Band-Aid off the 49ers. Uh, I know you had some strong words for Debo Samuel, not playing through his Jordan flu game of sorts <laughs> on uh, Sunday afternoon. Was out there for a couple snaps, decided that, no, nah, he wasn't going to be able yeah, to had go. The, had the sniffles. Had the it sniffles. It was in street clothes in the second half. Brandon Ayuk's knee, I-, I think part of the kneecap is still out there on the 50-yard line in Santa Clara. Uh, as it appears he'll be lost for the season. But even before the injury started to rack up and we knew the 49ers were going to be up against it in that regard, the offense for me, Payne, left a lot to be desired. All of the cheat codes that you've referred to for years were not evident from the 49ers and the things that you need against the defense that's as dynamic, that had two weeks to repair like Steve Spagnuolo. I mean, there was no play action. There was not a ton of pre-snap motion, and the 49ers offense looked relatively stagnant before you even factor in the red zone ineptitude that's been evident all season without Christian McCaffrey. Just not a great game plan from Kyle Shanahan from top to bottom, and Spags had his fastball working, and what I found even better was Tom Brady pretty much giving Spags his flowers there, talking about how that man stood in the way of Brady having two more Super Bowls on his resume. Really funny that... The one quarterback is calling the game, and the other quarterback is on the field, and it's the same thing that we've seen for for multiple decades now. As those two careers are obviously in in different paths, but if you go back to the Brady era, even in spots that looked fantastic, even in matchups that looked great, 
you know, trying to fade Tom Brady was uh, was not a profitable endeavor, and it's starting to to feel that way here uh, when Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid are are expected to maybe have a little bit of a down game. And I just think overarching, and this may seem harsh to some, you just saw the difference between winners and losers on full display. Right, That game was the epitome of a three-time Super Bowl champion versus a really talented team that just can't get over the hump because both quarterbacks made mistakes. Neither offense played to their ceiling. But every I single but, moment but, in that well, game. I'll let you finish and then I'll pick No, no, go no, ahead. I, say, I honestly don't know what the Chiefs' ceiling is offensively now. I mean, that's the brutal reality. And it makes it even that much more impressive that they're able to go out there, manufacture points. And when the offense has a down game like they did, the defense raises its level of play to come up with timely turnovers. Right. And, and you know, when you talk about a ceiling, it's specific to that offense. And maybe their ceiling is, is certainly has to be recalibrated without – Pacheco and Hollywood Brown and Rasheed Rice I I completely agree but I still don't think whatever their peak is it was it was on display here with some of the costly turnovers that Patrick Mahomes had and I just I go back and I'm thinking about this game and again it's it's the reason one of these teams has multiple Super Bowls and the other one is has failed every single moment in that game where you're like okay San Francisco's just one play away from gaining momentum Poof, the Chiefs just kind of ripped it away, right? I mean, the 49ers start the game and get a massive fourth down stop, set the tone, their offense is in good field position, can you know get the first score of the game. No, right? It's, it's an interception. You end up getting the first points on the board. You start to feel a little bit better about yourself, I guess, and the Chiefs just then methodically go back-to-back TD drives to zap all the momentum. San Francisco can get the momentum touchdown before the half. It's second and one at the KC5. They get held to three. Come out of the break, you cut the lead to 14-12. Payne, when you, Payne, the when you have a chance to run the football with no timeouts yeah. with 25 seconds third, to go on yeah, third down, you ridiculous. have to run the football. Yeah. And and so then, you know, you, you do come out of the half and, you, you know, you create the turnover and you cut the, the score to 14-12 and you miss the extra point. And it's like, okay, no worries. You get a stop. You're driving again, third and sixth, the KC 34. You're going to get some points. Wide open receiver for a first down. Purdy throws a pick. Chiefs go on and, and score TD, make it two scores. The game's over. Like every single big moment in that game, the Chiefs made the crucial play more times than not. And and that's what it came down to for me. And then you just look at the entire approach on that team and you can tell the frustration is is starting to carry over, right? Everyone, I think, expected Debo Samuel to play the game plan was certainly formed with Debo in mind he wakes up and I get it he's under the weather we saw a couple other players it's starting to be that time of the year we're a little under the weather Kenneth Walker went out played performed two touchdown game first game in in London there for Demario Douglas there was some sharp money there that I couldn't necessarily understand on some of his his receiving props because he is going to be the guy moving forward for Drake May but then after the game, you see why I didn't play in the second half was a little under the weather. But for Debo Samuel, I I mean, at what point? At what point is that guy going to be the guy? I'm sure I, he, I don't think he's ever going to be the guy is what the reality of it is now. Now you see your guy go down with a torn ACL and you're just you're out there not feeling well. You know? Just get on the field, man. Your guys are struggling without you. Saw Trent Richardson just super frustrated, gets ejected from the game. Trent Williams did get so, punched in the face first. I'll give him that much. Yes, yes, yeah. It, honestly, that's not a guy you probably want to punch in the face. You probably don't want to initiate with him first. Just my my general vibe there. <laughs> Trent's Trent's the guy you probably so solid. you're 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 going to you're like hey that's the guy I want in the foxhole. That's the guy like if you're in the the back alley like you you want him on your your side there. Um. But yeah, that to me that that was the entire the, the sil- game. Just, silver lining, I guess. Winners versus losers. The silver lining in this, uh, we need the 49ers to just lose two more games. Yeah, there you go. To to, to, go. to cash a win total, although yeah. rather they beat. Unfortunately, I think Ayuk's out. out yeah, I, it season. looks pretty bleak, Dunzo. and I'm not sure if Jawan when Jawan Jennings will return, knowing that they have a bye after their Sunday night game against the Dallas Cowboys coming up this week. Shanahan spoke his praise in the postgame press. He's like, man, I can't wait to get Jennings back. Well, apparently uh, it tells you all you need to know <laughs> about the, the, the way things are going there. Other bad before we pivot into the ugly uh, for what we've seen? 
I know you want to talk about C.J. Stroud. This is a Texans offense. Look, we broke this game down in great detail uh, on the Thursday podcast. Thought it was going to be a fascinating matchup. But if you told me the Texans still had a chance to win this game outright as a dog that took substantial money against, given all the defensive injuries, when C.J. Stroud finishes 10 of 21 for 86 yards, gets sacked four times, Stephon Diggs leads the team with five catches for 23 yards in the game, it doesn't all fall on C.J. Stroud, and I'm not going to unfairly pin it on his shoulders, but I think you encapsulated it perfectly, saying this is a below-average offense, and it really looked that way. And I guess maybe even the nice things we said about Joe Mixon still sold him short given what he's meant to this Texans offense. Because if you remove Mixon from the backfield, I'm not sure this offense isn't a bottom five group until Nico Collins returns. We thought Mixon would be the guy. Um, That was the biggest X factor for the Texans offense. He he showed up well. Um, The scoreboard will look like this was a semi shootout. It wasn't. Not even close. I'd love to meet the group that steamed that game over. Uh, Did take some under money again on game day, but at 47, the 47 could not hold in the market. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I thought thought it got to 48 at one point. Oh, it did. It got to 48 Um, and a half. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, we were were much lower than that number. They they did Uh, look good at 33 points at the break, even if they were Fugazi 33. They were, uh, oh, my God. It was a brutal, yeah. It was a brutal 33. So specific to Stroud. I mean, we didn't anticipate this being like some great outing, right? Broke that down Thursday. Just Packers use more man coverage. Stroud has been better against zone. Without Nico Collins, the Stroud metrics have been substantially worse. It was the first game all season the Texans have played on grass. We've seen them at home in the Dome. Their their offensive efficiency numbers are substantially, substantially better. Uh, but your hope is, right, your franchise quarterback can rise above all that and make everyone else around him better. It just you know, wasn't the case in this one-game sample. Cy Stroud had a completion rate 7% below expectation out of 26 offenses that have played this week so far. The Texans, 22nd in EPA per drop back, 20th in passing success rate. So Stroud was uh, a little bit disappointing. And you would think, right, based upon how Tank Dell performed last season, going out and trading for digs, that with Nico being out, you could at least survive a little bit, right? I mean, you, you signed Dalton Schultz to a decent tight end deal, so it's not like they're they're weaponless, that's for sure. Yeah, uh, I mean, we'll see what Houston brings to the table this week against the Indianapolis Colts, but... That's it. Yeah, I mean, listen, you, you, you know, certainly Nico's out again, but that's a... You know what you're getting from Gus, right? You're back at home. This should be a better offensive performance well, this week it, for, for the Texans. It can't be worse, I'll give you that much. Uh, I will get. I will give you that much. So, speaking of Anthony Richardson, when we go into the ugly, unless there's other bad that you wanted to highlight. No, let's. Uh, oof. What's funny is I wrote down my ugly before you sent me your ugly, and they were the same two. We just reversed the order. <laughs> All right. Well, then I guess we'll segue because the consummate pros we are with Anthony Richardson and get to the other in a second. Continues to struggle with his accuracy. Ten of twenty four. Yet good enough to get a 16-10 to 10 win against a Dolphins quarterback tandem that was Tyler Huntley before Tim Boyle took over in that game. He's yet to complete more than 50% of his passes in a game where he's attempted five-plus passes. 11% below expectation for the season for Anthony Richardson. He was even worse against the Dolphins. And, I mean, we're talking about a quarterback right now that's living in the same zip code of the Bo Nixes, the DTRs, and the Deshaun Watsons. Pain. Uh, I mean, Shane Steichen's got to be pulling his hair out, hoping that Richardson can at least improve the accuracy a bit. But, man, he may have a howitzer for an arm, but that thing's got next to zero accuracy in touch. Yeah, he wouldn't be on, like, the Chris Kyle sniper team. He'd be more of the grenade thrower. You just hopefully hit a vicinity. Pull the pin and pray. That's the only way it's working. (laughs) I mean, it's it's as bad as it gets for, for Anthony Richardson. Completion rate 14% below expectation against the Dolphins on Sunday. Dead last for the season at 11.5% below expectation. No other QB is even 7.5% below expectation this year. And the worst QBs, aside from AR, are backups, third stringers, and benched quarterbacks. It's Tyler Huntley, it's Spencer Rattler, it's Bryce Young, and... And on a day like yesterday where he's not even, you know, uh, a massive factor as a runner. 
had the 22-yard explosive, but his 13 other carries went for 34 yards. And you look at QBR, which factors in rushing, and and is supposed to paint Richardson in the most positive light, 50 as an average QB. Last three games for Anthony Richardson, 19-34-24 are those QBR ratings for Anthony Richardson. So I don't know what the plan is going to be moving forward. What I will say, and this is probably going too far left field, we were strongly considering the Dolphins yesterday. I know that. Both of us were. Yep. And very sharp money came in to push that thing under the th- very before kickoff. Very, 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 very sharp money. And once we kind of lost the number earlier in the week, we were looking for four. Very fortunate the fours got wiped out. I was happy about that. Now, Miami certainly should have that covered. That game should have ended 13-10. What's kind of shocking to me, and it was from multiple groups. There was one group that went first half over. There was another group on game day that went full game over. The Tyler Huntley love. Maybe I'm missing something No, you're here. not. It wasn't lost on the Ravens. There's a reason that the Ravens cut ties. You and I talked about this in passing when they first signed him, and you were like, hey, I'm a little, you know, I think this is going to be an upgrade. And I I didn't completely disagree. I just, in my mind, I'm like, how is this guy a scheme fit? I, it makes no sense. He's, he's not anywhere remotely an anticipatory passer, and we know how complex this passing offense is, and it's all about timing. It made no sense. And then to your point, you start to think about like what organization did this guy absolutely crush it for and backup duty? What system fits this guy that he's been entrenched in in multiple years? It's the Baltimore Ravens. The guy made a Pro Bowl backing up Lamar Jackson. And it's like, hey, we're done with him. So if the quarterback who's a perfect fit for an organization that has loyalty to him and is uber loyal to its players is like, Hey, we're done. What makes you think he's going to be the dude in a scheme that does not fit him in any manner? It just felt to me, the dolphins were desperate trying to find something hoping they could put a square peg into a round hole. And clearly it yeah. hasn't worked. I, I, I completely, completely understand. Now two is back this week. Does the market know that yet? Because looking at... Well, yeah, the market, the, t- the total's 48 <laughs> and a half, Todd. Yes, the I'm market knows it. I watch Arizona <laughs> take some money at three and a half. Uh, I, I think the question becomes, you know, is, is he a little rusty? You know, he's been out for, for a month. Is he going to be smart enough? And and this is certainly, you know, we're going way left field here. This is Payne's thoughts. Um, thoughts with Payne and, Insider. And probably are going to piss a lot of people off. But one, I, you know... I would have never signed to a to this long term deal. You and I had both had this conversation off air. I am very sympathetic for Tua and certainly hope there is no long term repercussions for the concussions that he has suffered and obviously he is he's a football player, right? He's provided generational wealth to his family and he's a grown man and he can make decisions on his own. Your hope is that he uses the lump three feet above his ass to make better decisions. And so I don't feel bad uh, what it transpired against the Buffalo Bills because your hope is when you pay a quarterback $250 million. He's not going to use his head to try and create leverage? Not down three scores, four yards past the sticks. Am I going to take on a, a safety head on, right? I mean, to me, it's just fucking stupid. So <laughs> I I mean I don't feel bad in that situation. You are a quarterback. Your goal before the play is to diagnose what I need to happen, what needs to go on. And so you want that guy to be a thinker. We have other players that can go be athletes and go be Tarzan. Down 3 scores, 4 yards past the sticks, right? It's got to be a slide. Not taking a defender head on. So he needs to be smarter. And so you feel for his situation uh, with the concussions, but you don't feel for him being a bumbling idiot in that scenario. He needs to be smarter. And so if he's smarter, um, you know, based upon what Miami has left on the schedule, this was certainly a crucial game. Man, you go to 3-3, three and two is back. The vibes are good in that locker room. You're in the mix still. 
that was a, that was a big game to drop. So uh, we'll see if he's a little bit smarter and, and, and can last the season. Then, then Miami might have an outside shot at, at making a little bit of a playoff run despite all the injuries. Well, you mentioned being stupid, and um, I'm not sure if you want to outline what I would best define and probably the nicest way to put it, the negative EV move made by the head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders at a key juncture of the football game to do absolutely nothing to improve the Raiders' odds of winning a game from a mathematical win probability standpoint. I give you Exhibit A, Antonio Pierce, and kicking a field goal, trailing by eight. From the Rams nine yard line. So I'm sitting here watching this game, and I'll give the full context as we have we elected not to to grab the the Raiders at like seven point two five. Instead we just hey, we're gonna we're gonna tease the tease the Rams down because we can get one and there's more value in the teaser being able to get down to one with the line at seven point two five, right? And the Rams didn't play a great game by any stretch. But I'm sitting here watching the game. <laughs> and they're down eight. And I'm like, boy, he's going to do what he's going to do, isn't he? Uh, he's going to help us out here. He is going to roll out the field goal team. There's no doubt in my from mind. Do I know my man or do I know my yard line? It's not like it was fourth <laughs> and 26 from the 27. And sure enough, like 12 seconds later, out trots the field goal team with with two minutes and and 30 seconds to go, down eight. Well, it was like a seven-minute drive. I mean, he doesn't have an explosive offense, right? So even if Sharon Moore was jealous watching the Raiders move the ball down the field that way. And I think if you're watching it and you're you're like an Antonio Pierce apologist, you're going to be like, see, they got the ball back. They got the ball back. Well, first of all, it was like a shoestring tackle on 2-2 Atwell or else it's a first down and the game's over. And it was a perfect play call because Pierce and company sent blitz to the complete opposite side and McVeigh sniffed it out and threw a wide receiver screen the complete opposite <laughs> way. Had Robinson not whiffed the block, Tutu's maybe still running. Uh, but aside from that, like, yeah, they got the ball back at their 11 with 90 seconds to go and no timeouts and you don't have an explosive player on offense. Right, Brock Browers is fantastic. He ain't hitting like a 70-yard seam. You just traded Adams away. Jacoby Myers ain't playing. It's like, how did you anticipate getting down the field quickly? Trey Tucker, 65-yarder on a fly pattern. <sighs> so, one of the worst decisions that we've seen all season, and most of the worst decisions in those moments have come from Antonio Pierce, and he has not, he has not learned the lesson. At At some point, you would think this is like a, Saturday Night Live skit where he's just trying to get reaction from sports betters and and sharp analytics minds and now the one thing I- this is a billion, like this is a multi billion dollar organization there are folks out there like pouring seventy hour weeks into this the one thing, thing I will say Payne and this guy doesn't know when to the kick one thing I will or say, go Payne, for it or when the punt he's based here in Las Vegas there were point spread implications maybe Antonio Pierce needed to get inside the number for all the Raiders boosters yeah I, I you know that's that's you know. That that's a conversation for someone else. That's not. For I'm me. kidding on that. You play to win the game, and clearly that decision making process or the decision tree there, a little more than two minutes to go, doesn't pay off for the Raiders, and they come up short, losing twenty to fifteen to the Rams. You can follow Payne on social media at Payne Insider. I'm Todd Furman. You can follow me there for all things Bet the Board podcast related. Be sure to follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. Look ahead lines, and we can gun through these with two Monday Night Football games still to get to, Payne. Chargers haven't played yet this week. Hasn't stopped the betting market from responding to what we saw from the Saints on Thursday night against the Denver Broncos. Chargers go from six to seven and a half. New Orleans, they can't lose more bodies between Thursday night's game against the Broncos and Sunday, but you never know with this Saints team who continues to battle attrition at a lot of key positions on the offensive and defensive side. Yeah, there you go. All right. You said it. I mean, all of those injuries and the Saints are are the worst team in the NFL. Worse than what we saw from the Carolina Panthers? They're the worst team in the NFL, Todd, with those injuries. Pretty impressive. We thought the division was going to be shit. We didn't know the Saints and Panthers were going to (laughs) finish 31 and 32 the way they're trending in terms of overall power profile. Uh, I think what we are going to potentially see is do we get to 10 and is it Hayner and is Alave up? Because at that point, 
you know, if it's Hayner and Alave's up, then, you know, but, you know, I, they haven't been able to stop the run. And you know the Chargers are going to bully ball. So the matchup ain't great on that side of the ball either. Uh, but I think, yeah, you know, Circa the highest in the market at eight and a half right now. Books are going to have to protect themselves from teasers. So inherently, we probably have to tick up a little bit higher. Yeah. The um, only way it makes sense to run and bet the dog now, in my opinion, is if you think the, charge, ex, if the Chargers go out there and win comfortably tonight against Arizona. Right. Would, Say that one more time. That if you like the dog, oh, Jesus, if you like the dog. Yeah, you flip Yeah, if you, if you like the dog okay. here, the only reason to bet them now would be because the be Chargers the go out yeah. there and lose the Cardinals tonight. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So my, my yep. logic, eventually I was going to get there in a roundabout circuitous fashion. Bengals, <laughs> three-point favorites on a look ahead. We're now looking at them coming off of the key down at two and a half in the wake of the Bengals. Best described as a workmanlike performance against the Cleveland Browns, aided by a 100-yard kickoff return to start that game. And on the flip side, Philadelphia more than workmanlike with a 28-3 to dismantling of the Giants. Three down to two and a half, although two and a half flats. And even a two that was out there did not last. We're now up to two and a half minus no. 20. No. Uh, we'll break this game down in greater detail yeah, on Thursday. I, so we don't need to play spoiler on this one right about now. Uh, Broncos, Bron- Broncos, Panthers, Broncos from four and a half out to seven and a half. Uh, I mean, Carolina, I don't know what the hell that was offensively with the Andy Dalton experience. And then what impressed me the most, you put Bryce Young in the game, and what was his average intended air yards? Minus four, throwing screens behind the line of scrimmage to bleed the clock? <sighs> On third and six, yeah, threw it two yards behind the line of scrimmage there. I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, it's This morning, uh, there was a group that went over 41 and a half, literally, I don't know, 15 minutes ago as we were recording. So we did see some over money there. A little surprised Carolina couldn't score anything on a commander's defense that is well below average and was missing at least three starters. So that was a little bit surprising to me. Uh, Denver should be able to get their ground game going here, which makes Bo Nix somewhat competent. Even the, with that that ground game going against New Orleans, had a Bo Nix had a completion rate that was uh, well below expectation, one of the worst marks again of the week. But um, I I just wonder, you know, if we're getting to a point here, and I you know, I say that a lot on these games. Uh, but hey, you know, if you fast forward to week 14, what is this line? I mean, I don't think Carolina has quit. I just think they're they're pretty bad. Um, the offensive line, your hope is that maybe is a little bit bit healthier. So we'll have to keep our eye on on Carolina's offensive line situation because, you know, Denver's going to be sending sending the blitz, going to be sending the pressure. And uh, that's about it for this game right now, but that's the reason for the move, obviously. Yep, two uh, very different results that we saw over the weekend. Denver winning comfortably by margin, and Carolina losing uncomfortably by margin to by there's a 30-plus point defeat. And then the Monday night game that we'll preview a week from today, the Pittsburgh Steelers welcome in the New York Giants as they continue their primetime parade. Three and a half was the opener on this game, or I shouldn't say the opener, the look ahead that was widely available. The Steelers take care of business against the Jets that we mentioned in the good, bad, and the ugly. The Giants more than stubbed their toe against Philly. And not only have we gone to six and a half, one of the sharpest shops in the world, Payne, is now up to a juice seven if you want to back the dog. Yep, yep. Yep. Uh, different role for the old Steelers, right? Underdogs on, on Sunday night football. Uh, short favorites. This is this is a little bit of a, a different role for Pittsburgh. So it will be interesting to see potentially how long that, that seven lasts in the market. We'll see if it's there by the time the podcast is over. From the look-ahead numbers into the pair of Monday night games, and while normally we do a deep dive with one, we'll hit on a key factor or two for each of these games. So we can start with the early game that you can actually see on normal human people TV instead of just streaming like the second game that kicks off at 9 o'clock Eastern between the Ravens... Oh, second game's on streaming. ESPN Plus exclusive. Uh, Ah, okay. Ravens and Bucks, Ravens three and a half point favorites. This total has been an absolute battle. Uh, took over money early in the week, got as high as 50 and a half, 51, got bet, un- sorry, took 
under money early in the week. Jesus, under money early in the week, down to 48. There you Holy go. Holy yeah. hell, this has been a rough show. I get back to 50, <laughs> pretty much painted across the board. The Raven- What went on last night? I know the wife was out of nothing. town. That's the What's, worst part. What, what, what Absolutely happened? nothing. There were no illicit substances. <laughs> there were no excessive drinking. <laughs> Uh, there, there was nothing to try and help uh, alleviate the weight of the world of <laughs> the struggles that we've had around these parts. You didn't, you didn't take a trip to Denver, I, I huh? Didn't, I didn't get Rocky Mountain High, unfortunately. <laughs> a little bit disappointing and anticlimactic, uh, if I'm being extremely forthright. Uh, Ravens injury report looks pretty clean for the Bucks. We're trying to identify who may or may not be out. Jamel Dean ruled out, but all accounts point to everybody else being available for them. We know with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, they have been a team willing to throw early and often so far this season, and it's paid extreme dividends given what Baker Mayfield has been able to do. 9.1 yards per attempt and 16 targets when he's targeting or targeting Mike Evans and Chris Godwin over the last 12 games. I mean, Godwin has been outstanding this season. Baker, 43 of 53 for 81% completion percentage going in that general direction. The Bucs approaching things with a backfield by committee against the Ravens' run defense that's been amongst the best in the league, but the pass defense leaves something to be desired. And on the other side, Payne, we identify the Ravens and what they can do offensively. They want to run the football. Tampa's run defense should be a little bit better with a couple of the big fellas there in the trenches. Antoine Winfield back in the fold who returned last week. And a defense that most likely trends up with a lot of their key cogs here. So when you try and find a matchup that you think can determine the outcome in this game, what are you most fascinated to see transpire at Raymond James Stadium tonight under the bright lights? So I games like this are just fun to me because there's so many differing opinions on it. It feels like it's the case more and more these days. If you knew how last Monday morning early went, very interesting because there's a group that I speak with that was literally queued up, ready to go on the over at 49 and a half, 50. And probably about 15 minutes before they're about to send in this buy order, <laughs> another group comes in and wipes out the under at 48. And then it looked like there was some potential rain and and wind in the forecast and the thought process was like hey you know what we got 48 we're gonna hold this a little bit and and see what and then another group went out and and bet over 48 and so here we are basically (laughs) at the same number as last monday at 49 and a half 50 from a side perspective when this gets to four four and a half we've seen some tampa money it just doesn't feel like it's ever going to get to three which is a buy point for one specific group that's that's very model focused. So I think three and a half is probably the number that we're going to live with here. Maybe a little more anticlimactic in terms of of side movement from now until kickoff. In terms of matchups, there's two, and both uh, derive from pressure. When Tampa's on offense, and you hit this perfectly, they have one of the highest pass rates on early downs, and you love to see that. Liam Cohen is has been fantastic. Hopefully that continues tonight because Baltimore does not get pressure on early downs. It seems to be like a philosophical belief for for Zach or his goal is to stop the run on early downs. It's about staying in rush lanes, keeping integrity, not getting after the quarterback like chickens with with, with your heads cut off on, on early downs, and it's led to a Ravens run defense that's number one on early downs, only allowing 26% of runs to be successful. It's number number one in the NFL. On third down, though, the Ravens defense is number one in pressure rate. So it's important to attack through the air if you're Tampa on early downs when Baker isn't going to be pressured as much. The other thing that we have seen is the Ravens have been very vulnerable to the explosive play, one of the worst defenses in the league in terms of explosive pass defense. The Buccaneers' offense hits gobs of explosives. The difference with them, though, isn't necessarily through the air. It's a ton of run after the catch, which, again, you give credit to Liam Cohen for design because he's got defenses always guessing. And so, you know, we saw Godwin with a lot of run after the catch. The Ravens have to remain great tacklers in this spot, currently graded out the number one tackling team. So if they can... 
they have a better opportunity, I think, to negate some of the explosives because they're not necessarily deep down the field in the air. They're more of, again, run after the catch. And so that could be interesting here uh, in terms of the Ravens tackling ability and negating the version of the explosive the Bucks typically hit. The second factor for me is pressure on the other side. And this was this was pretty telling is, you know, if you remember, we talked in the offseason about Lamar dropping all of this weight. His goal was to be a little bit more mobile with that weight loss. He has been fantastic this season against the Blitz, and Todd Bowles is going to send the Blitz. It's, he's at the top of the league every single year. Tampa right now, fourth highest Blitz rate. And years past, this would be an issue. And if you look from 2020 to 2023, four seasons, the Blitz has actually given Lamar Fitz negative EPA per drop back over that four-season stretch. This season, however, with this weight loss, with Todd Munkin being able to put a couple more safety valves in there for Lamar to handle the blitz. Lamar's torching it. Plus 0.3 EPA per drop back when blitzed with a 60% success rate. He's attacking the attacker, so he's pushing the ball further downfield, and yet the completion rate is 69% higher over this this last like four-year sample size. So uh, if Todd Bowles is going to send the blitz tonight, Lamar has shown an ability, especially in the intermediate window, to really attack that. And Jamel Dean, one of the lead corners for Tampa Bay, is is out this evening. It'll be interesting to me, though. Like I think, you know, you look at Zion McCollum and how how good he's been. You know, can he remove Zay Flowers and and then you're reliant on Bateman. And I know Bateman's had some some crap talked about him. And he has not produced at the level to where he was he was picked. It just feels like him and Lamar are never on the same page. But if you just look at Bateman's individual data in terms of like separation, he continues to be a monster in that department. So it'd be great if, you know, McCollum's taken away Zay Flowers, that that Bateman can be involved. Uh we know Todd Munkin's going to use his his linebackers, uh, or his uh tight ends rather to attack linebackers. So this is this is a good matchup. I can see why there's some differing opinions. If you like really really dig into the weeds, you can make a case for the over. If you're just looking at some of the surface level components where you're saying to yourself, "Hey, we understand the Ravens defense isn't as good as it was a season ago, but they're certainly not horrific like everyone thinks. It's still an above average defense in totality." And you're saying to yourself, hey, they're stepping down in class. They just faced, you know, and they faced the gobs of mobile quarterbacks with, you know, you know Mahomes and, and uh, Josh Allen. And we saw Burrow, who we don't necessarily think is mobile, like have a 50-yard explosive against the Giants. And Jaden Daniels, right? We've played some really good offenses in the last couple of weeks. We're, we're stepping down in class here. And then you look at Tampa's success, the two defenses that they've played that are semi-competent, They've struggled against, right? It wasn't, I know they won the game in Detroit, much to our chagrin, but it was, you know, less than 300 yards of offense against that Lions defense. The Broncos defense dominated them. So from surface level, things of that nature, right? And and you're looking at these two teams, again, where like the Buccaneers are explosive after the catch. The Ravens aren't really threatening deep down the field. There's that methodical nature to this potentially. That's how you can see the the under-hitting. Um, and so that, that's, that's really where the battle's coming here. It's going to be fun to, to see unfold. Um, I do not have a, a horse in this race yet, but, and we'll see, we'll see how the market progresses over the next handful of hours. We have a horse in the race from a prop player perspective. We'll get to that shortly as Billy drops a little bit Ah, of a nugget there for us. But before just when I thought you were out, you redeem yourself. What a transition there. We'll we'll get, we'll get to that prop, but let's cover the second game first. uh, And then we'll disclose exactly what we find. See If we were smart, we would have, we would have plopped the prop in between. No, the two no, no. We want to yes. keep people sticking yeah. around okay. for the late game between the Chargers and Cardinals okay. as well. I gotcha. I so gotcha. for this game, kicks off a little bit later, 45 minutes to be exact. The Chargers, a modest one-point road favorite for their trip to Glendale. Total on this game has been bet up from where it opened at 41.5 out to 44, even some 44 and a half. The dog has taken some money as well. As far as trying to identify paths in this one, 
Coach Harbaugh has been tremendous when it comes to playing on Monday Night Football. A lot of those wins with, were with the 49ers. We know that the Chargers want to run the football, run the football, and run it again. And it's what we've seen all season long from a group that's gone from a rushing yards per game standpoint from 25th in the league to 10th. They're playing at a snail's pace. The one thing for the Chargers that's hard to ignore is how anemic their offense has been after the break, averaging just five points per game in the second half. It's actually the lowest mark in the NFL uh, entering the week. J.K. Dobbins has been the bell cow back. Gus Edwards on IR. We're seeing splashes of Kamani Vidal get filtered in there, the running back out of Troy. The receiving room didn't have a ton of weapons to begin with. Gets a little bit leaner with Quentin Johnson expected to miss. Lad McConkey banged up as well. Justin Herbert, though, did show more mobility in recovery from that high ankle sprain in the first half against the Denver Broncos. Chargers, though, haven't faced a murderer's row uh, of offenses from them on a defensive side. I mean, defensively, they played the Raiders, the Panthers, the Steelers, the Chiefs without Rasheed Rice for the better part of three and a half quarters, and the Denver Broncos. In steps the Arizona Cardinals, who haven't been dynamic in their own right. Uh, They were downright awful last week against the Green Bay Packers. The only silver lining there was Trey McBride, finally featured prominently in their attack, season highs and receptions, catching all eight of his targets. Marvin Harrison Jr. left that game with a concussion. He clear protocol and be back in the mix James Conner a little bit dinged up so many different ways to try and go about it I think when you're trying to find a pass for the Chargers it's pretty obvious it's they want to run the football against the Arizona Cardinals defensive front which has really struggled to stop anybody with a pulse running the ball but on the other side this is a Chargers defense that hasn't really had a deal with dynamic offenses and playmakers that maybe Arizona can put them into a bit of conflict and force the Chargers to play from a negative game state there you go I mean that's it and seven days ago we were talking about this game on the Monday morning recap. We said, if this gets to three, expect Cardinals money. Seven days later, we're at one, one and a half. It got to three. And there has been multiple buy orders on the Cardinals at three, at two and a half, at two. Advantage teasers, you name it. And I do think the Chargers probably find some offensive success tonight. Um Running the ball, to your point, it's as obvious as it gets. Every single team who plays the Cardinals targets this area, right? I mean, Arizona right now has seen 30 rushing attempts from running backs on average this season per game. It's the clear path. Everyone sees it, and we know the Chargers are going to lean on that tonight. I think... You know, just talking out loud here, the buy on Arizona is is multifaceted, right? One, it was in anticipation of Marvin Harrison Jr. being upgraded. So getting out ahead of, of information that wasn't factored into the market at that point, getting the extra day and and getting information that, hey, this isn't as, as serious of a concussion as, say, Malik Neighbors. But the biggest factor is selling um the, the Chargers. You're actually buying you're actually buying the idea rather that the Chargers defense is is overvalued in a market based on schedule. That's the other factor here, right? That that Arizona is going to be able to find some offense tonight based upon what the Chargers defense actually is, right? It's the Chargers faced the Raiders in week one. It was the Panthers with Bryce Young in week two. It's the Steelers with Justin Fields in week three. It's the Chiefs week four. Nice but Mahomes shreds Rasheed Rice's knee in, in like early in the first half. It's the first game without Pacheco for the Chiefs. And then it was the Broncos offense last week. The average efficiency rank of those opponents would be like facing the 24th best offense each and every single week. That's what the Chargers defense has faced to this point in the season. If you remove the Chiefs data point, the Chargers are faced the very easiest schedules of offenses in the entire NFL. And so you are you're selling the Chargers defense a little bit based upon the schedule that they have faced at this point in time. And that's that's the reason for the buy in the Cardinals to this point, whether it was at three and whether it was in teasers at two and a half and two. Um 
Now we'll see if ultimately that unfolds. But the other thing we discussed on Monday, because it was happening as we were recording, was a group sent out the over at 41 and a half. There really has not been any resistance. We are now at the key of 44 and even some 44 and a half, and we still have not seen the stop sign yet. It'll be interesting to see if 44 and a half is the number. To this point, it is not. It is 11.50 a.m. Eastern time. It's game day. Limits are are up there right now. And, and still no buy on the under. So that's basically the synopsis of this one here. Are you going to stay awake for the late game or are you going to be watching that? I am the, not. I'm going to. A bridge version. I'm going to try to. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to try to get a little little sleep tonight. Right. That that's the Expect goal. at least seven plus hours out of you. Need you well rested for the uh, college show with BP on Wednesday. Oh, I thought it was off again this week. No, 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 no. Uh, that no? no, that's not. You don't get multiple. No. You don't get multiple oh. bye weeks here. Oh, jeez. I, I thought and we. I checked. I checked the. I checked the weather that. forecast as well. You can't oh. use Mother Nature. Na- I thought. I thought Nadine was going to come in there and give us a little wind. <laughs> uh. Oh, two Monday Night Football breakdowns. We've provided some of the matchups to watch, but we bring in the maestro of trying to figure out props to figure out an aspect that he feels is actionable in tonight's game that'll highlight the Baltimore Ravens' run defense against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers' trio of backs in the early kickoff. All right, guys. Week 7, Monday Night Football. We got two games tonight. We got Baltimore-Tampa Bay, and we have the L.A. Chargers and Arizona. I'm going to give out a prop for the Baltimore-Tampa Bay game on the pod, and then if something comes across and we bet something significant in the L.A.-Arizona game, I will tweet that, tweet that out later. No promises on that. So let's go to the prop for Baltimore-Tampa Bay. We're going to go Rashad White, under 27.5 rush yards. If you cannot get that price, so it is widely available at DraftKings, Hard Rock, MGM all have this prop. There is some 45 and a half out there on Russian receiving. I would also consider that a play, but we really like the under 27 and a half rush yards. Here's the deal with this one. Liam Cohen, Todd Bowles, they've come out and reiterated that this is a split back system right now, and they will ride with the hot hand between Rashad White, Bucky Irving, and Sean Tucker. Of the three, White has really proven to be the least explosive, and he's now coming off of a foot injury. He's listed as questionable. It looks like he's going to play... But how effective is he is he going to be in this game? And then when we look at the what this coaching staff has said, they really want to go with the guy who's explosive, giving them chances for big plays. I can't see Rashad White being that guy at the three. Now, when we look at Tampa Bay run metrics, they look good on paper. But removed last week versus New Orleans, who obviously cannot stop a soul right now, and they weren't with Rashad White. So Tampa Bay was without Rashad White. They played New Orleans. You remove that game and you see that they're only 18th in run offense EPA uh, efficiency and 20th in rush success rate. Now they go up against Baltimore, who's one of, if not the stoutest run defense in the NFL. They're third in defensive line yards, fourth in rush EPA. And they've done that the past three weeks against some very formidable offensive rushing attacks in Washington, Buffalo, and Cincinnati. Even if you just took those three teams... Baltimore still finished third in rush success rate defense against Washington, Buffalo, and Cincinnati. Final point on this one, game state and opponent we talk about a lot. Tampa Bay is a a three-and-a-half point underdog, so it's not like the market is telling you, oh my gosh, Tampa Bay is going to be the super sharp side here. In my mind, if they were the three-and-a-half, probably wouldn't be lasting. So they're going up against Baltimore, and they're they're an underdog, probably going to be playing from behind a bit in this game. And their opponent, Baltimore, they have the ability to not only build leads but drain clocks in the offensive end with Derrick Henry and Lamar Jackson running the ball. So we're going to go with Rashad White under 27.5 rush yards for the pod bet. Best of luck, guys. Billy echoing a a lot of our same sentiments in terms of what we expect from the Ravens' run defense before you even factor in the overall health. Uh, of Rashad White, who's been on and off the injury report. We know he didn't play last weekend against the Saints and left a game off the resume where he had an outstanding chance to kind of pad the stats. Yeah, 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 yeah. Looking at something really quickly here. This is really bad. Great podcasting. For podcasting, but... Did you find what you were looking for? We are there. Okay. 
Um, and 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 <laughs> twenty seven and a half is uh, is widely available, uh, even as we record right now at eleven fifty. And I believe Billy sent that clip to us about two hours ago. So still widely available. And and I echo some of those sentiments. If you've listened to anything that's come out of Leon Cohen's mouth, he's going to go with the hot hand. He is going to rely on that. And now all of a sudden it's not just Bucky Irving competing for some of those touches with a less than 100% Rashad white, but it's also the potential of, of Sean Tucker. So uh, we could see three mouths to feed in, in this backfield this evening. So fully on board with that problem. All right, we'll see what we can do there. And hope that it is the proud running back of Syracuse and Oregon's finest, assuming the lion's share of responsibilities instead of the Sun Devil in Rashad White. Done enough damage, I think, for a Monday. Anything else you'd like to share? Any jokes you'd like to make? Anything else? No, off we're the well over an hour. Well over the hour, which is which is uh, a little odd uh, for a Monday. That's what happens. You get amped up on a Monday. We go rambling 45 minutes before we even hit the record button, and... Uh, Things get off the rails slowly but surely. But for Pain Insider, you can follow him on social media at Pain Insider. I'm Todd Furman. Follow me there. Most importantly, for all things podcast related, be sure to follow the podcast at Bet the Board Pod. Best of luck with your Monday night football investments, whether they're in one game, two games, or any other pursuits tonight. And most importantly, with a Rashad White under rushing yards ticket in hand, we'll see you at the window. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Bet the Board. Make sure you follow Todd and Payne on X. Todd is at Todd Furman. That's T-O-D-D-F-U-H-R-M-A-N. And Payne is at Payne Insider. That's P-A-Y-N-E-I-N-S-I-D-E-R. Don't forget, our weekly newsletter comes with an additional best bet. Have that delivered to your inbox by clicking the link atop the podcast show notes. And most importantly, subscribe and download Bet the Board. We're on Apple, Spotify, Amazon Wondery, YouTube, Google Podcasts, and all your other major platforms.